Okay, so uh, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thank you to all of you who have uh, decided to come here today to listen to uh, my defense of my PhD thesis, living in rural Uganda, uh, living with type 2 diabetes in rural Uganda, uh, exploring the household as an intersection for diabetes management risk and behaviors. And thank you for the three opponents for taking time to uh, evaluate my PhD thesis. So. So uh, before I start to take you through uh, what I've been working with for the last three years, I would like to uh, just um, tell you the overall objective so you know sort of where we are heading. So the overall objective for this PhD study was to investigate how living in the same household as someone with diabetes influenced the other members' um, uh, <laughs> risk status for the very same disease, their knowledge about the disease, and then in return how these members uh, support the person with the type 2 diabetes and then in order, uh, or in order to manage it. But this is the agenda we will go through. And to start up, we will have a little background information. And first of all, I would like to give you a very, very brief introduction to the health system in Uganda, which is very different from the health system in Denmark. So there are three types of uh, providers in the professional health system. We have the government uh, health facilities, which are free of charge. There are the private not-for-profit uh, facilities, which charge uh, a little fee and is often church-based. And then we have the private facilities, which charge quite a high fee for a local Ugandan person. The healthcare facilities are tied into a five-level um, structure where we have the health center five or the hospital at the highest level, and then the lowest well level consists of these uh, village health team members. But if we look at the distribution of people with uh, diabetes across the world, we can see that Sub-Saharan Africa actually has the lowest amount of people uh, having diabetes, but we can also see that it's in this region we have the highest amount of people with undiagnosed diabetes. So even though it's the area of the world with the lowest uh, number of people with diabetes, if we look at the expected increase in the prevalence of diabetes within the next 20 years, we can see that the highest relative increase will actually takes place, uh, take place in this region. So what is, what is the prevalence of diabetes in Uganda? So far there are no national surveys, um, but there are five smaller studies who in different areas of Uganda have um, investigated the prevalence. They found prevalences ranging from 0.4 and all the way up to 22%. And this large uh, range is most likely explained by different diagnostic tools, different study populations, and different age in the cohorts. So what is it like uh, for diabetes, um, for the prevention and treatment of type 2 diabetes in Uganda? It's just a little background information. In the Ministry of Health in 2007, 2006, <laughs> uh, um, a section for non-communicable diseases was launched, and they had the mandate um, to reduce the morbidity and mortality due to non-communicable diseases. When it comes to diabetes, so far, there is a limit availability of diabetes treatment, at least in the professional health system. Uh, there is no implemented policy for the, um, neither for the prevention or the management of diabetes. Uh, there are very little uh, foreign gene development aid or just aid uh, supporting patients with diabetes. So living with diabetes is a disease that uh, takes daily management. You need to control your blood levels um, or you will uh, be at increased risk of these uh, diabetes-related complications. So what is it like to manage diabetes in Sub-Saharan Africa? There are a few studies um, uh, investigating this topic. Actually, there are only two who have done longitudinal studies, and they are quite old. They're back from the 80s and back from the 90s. And they found that within six years after the diagnosis of diabetes, 18 to 40 percent of the patients uh, were dead. So what is it like to manage diabetes in Uganda? There's very few studies of that as well. There is one study showing that only around one-fifth of the patient with diabetes uh, reach the target for a good management of diabetes. And I would like to point out that this study is done in a private not-for-profit facility in the capital, so the, the management of diabetes may look very different in other areas of the country. So 
Type 2 diabetes can be prevented. It has been shown in high-income countries where interventions, and interventions targeting weight loss uh, through a healthy and balanced diet and increased physical activity uh, showed uh, to be able to prevent that type 2 diabetes. And the studies have also been conducted in middle-income countries, but no studies so far have been conducted in low-income countries. So we actually don't know how this is applicable to a country like Uganda. And also, if we look at these studies, they were all randomized clinical trials. They included high-risk individuals. There has not been any screening campaigns in Uganda, so we actually don't know who the high-risk individuals are. Um, and also, all these interventions had a quite high resource, resource demand, and Uganda is already having a, a health system which is overwhelmed with infectious diseases. So why look at the household for the intersection of the management of diabetes? Type 2 diabetes, sorry. Well, if you have someone who is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, that person has in some way to manage his or her diabetes. And that will most often uh, be done with some sort of interaction with the health system, who then in return provides the person with diabetes with some homework, which is a concept developed by some, uh, a group of American and Danish uh, researchers. And the homework is often all the tasks that the, the patient with diabetes has to carry out in the home setting. It's monitoring blood glucose, it's changes in diet, it's changing uh, uh, physical activity levels. And in order to do this, the patient is most often supported by the family. And if we look into uh, the health systems in uh, or the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, family is actually quite important uh, in, a, in a country where the health system is often, um, is often not, uh, what, what you say, sufficient to take care of the, the sick people. The family is often the primary care unit. And then why look at the household for prevention of type 2 diabetes? Well, again, if we have someone who's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, who lives in a household together with a family, what is their risk of diabetes then? Well, some of them may be related to the person with diabetes, and genetic, uh, uh, genetics are a high, <laughs> it's, a, it's a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, and so are lifestyle-related risk factors. And most often, living in the same household, you will often eat the same type of food. Um, so these people may be high-risk individuals. We don't know in, in Uganda setting. But we also know that uh, in some parts of the country, um, the person with diabetes is provided with some sort of education. And some of the management of diabetes related to diet and to, um, to physical activities are some of the so same means that can actually prevent type 2 diabetes. And we know from some studies that, um, which looked at uh, weight loss interventions, that there may be a spillover from the person participating in an intervention, and then to the people they share a household with. So maybe it's the same for diabetes. We don't know. So this, uh, all these pathways uh, consist of theoretical framework for this uh, study that I have conducted. Okay, so I will, um, in order to investigate uh, these uh, pathways, we developed three sub-studies, where the first sub-study wanted to compare um, cardiometabolic risk factors in individuals living in the same households as a person diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And we then wanted to compare them to individuals living in a household where no one has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or with diabetes. In the second sub-study, we wanted to investigate the diffusion of diabetes-related knowledge and risk factor modification from the health system to the patient and on to the other family members or the other household members. I may sometimes uh, confuse, uh, not confuse, but use both family members and household members. In this study, we looked specifically at household members, meaning that they lived in the same household as the person with type 2 diabetes. In the last study, we wanted to explore the challenges of accessing and maintaining treatment for type 2 diabetes in a rural African setting uh, by examining the landscape of availability of, um, of treatment, the therapeutic journeys of the patients when they have to navigate within this landscape, 
and then also how their man therapy management group influenced their, their treatment. And um, the therapy management group is, is family members, or like in my case, uh, if I'm sick, I would call my mom. <laughs> so she would be part of my therapy management group, and you probably all have someone you call when you're sick. Um, so here. Yeah. So I will go a little uh, fast over the methodology, but I would like to show those of you who have not uh, heard about this study before how we actually did it. So the, it was a mixed method uh, study where we collected both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, the design was built up as a case called control design. We had cases which was household with diabetes, which I have called diabetic households, and they had one member with diagnosed type 2 diabetes. The controls were then household where there was no diagnosed uh, type 2 diabetes. And for those of you who are a little in doubt where Uganda is, it's located here in the eastern part of, um, of Africa. Uh, and our study took part in Kaseza district, which is bordering the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's in a mountainous area uh, due to the Ravensori Mountains. And in Kaseza district, approximately 750,000 uh, people uh, live there. So looking a little more at Kaseza district, the hospital is here. Uh, the hospital that we uh, used as like uh, our start, uh, start, uh, start point, and it's located uh, approximately midway between the two largest towns in the district. The district hospital is out here, and um, just to give you an idea what it's like to live in, in this area of Uganda, if you live up here in the mountain and you have to go to treatment at the government hospital, uh, it's probably like if you lived in Copenhagen and you wanted to go to Lolland Falster for treatment or something. So this is the hospital, you can see the uh, mountains. And then at the hospital, every week there is a diabetes clinic for adults. And the uh, it, diabetes clinic has an educational component where this nurse is teaching the patients. The hospitals uh, also have files for the diabetes patients who um, attend the clinic. And we took all these files, made a spreadsheet in Excel, and uh, got out uh, 356 uh, patients. In order to be included in this study, there were a few uh, inclusion criteria at the patient level um, that you can see here. And they were mainly uh, chosen because we wanted to make sure that the patient had uh, the chance of being exposed to his education and it had some time to like, diffuse potentially to the family. And then we chose 40 years of age as the time of diagnosis because we wanted to increase the likelihood that it was type type 2 diabetes and not another subtype of, of diabetes. That gave us uh, 79 potential participants or patients. And then after we had these patients, we also had some inclusion criteria at a household level. And um, we had to exclude three households with uh, type 2 diabetes due to these inclusion criteria. And then we had quite a number of exclusion criteria, but in total we only had to exclude two families with diabetes and one family without uh, diabetes. In order to find the control household, we used this sampling diagram that I will not go into here. Um, and then before the data collection, every household had a visit where they agreed to participate. And then on the day of data collection, we got full uh, informed consent from all of the participants. So the data collection, um, we had a lot of equipment. We packed into the car. We tried to reach the household at sunrise because we wanted to measure fasting blood, uh, plasma sugar. And we also wanted uh, to make sure that people had not left to go to the garden or go somewhere else. Most of these people have no mobile phones. So, so we had to be there before they forgot that we were coming. For some households, we could drive all the way up. And for some households, we had to walk up uh, the mountain for like an hour, and we had to carry up this 75 kilo of equipment uh, for the visits. In total, we visit uh, 90 households, of which half of them had one uh, member with diagnosed type 2 diabetes. That gave us 437 individuals above 13 years of age. And here I will just show you some pictures of how the data was collected. collected. Uh, we had to bring some power ourselves, since uh, most of these households had no electricity. But we then measured HbA1c and fasting plasma glucose. We measured the blood pressure. We also wanted, were interested in anthropometry. So we measured the height, we measured the weight, and we measured the waist and the hip circumference. We then also measured the mid-upper arm circumference and the skin fold thickness so we could estimate um, 
make some uh, body fat estimates. We also conducted this uh, step test because we wanted to estimate uh, aerobic capacity. We had five questionnaires. Three of them were for all of the participants and two were only for the, this one was the head of the household and this one was for the person in charge of the cooking. One of the questions, this one, knowledge about diabetes, um, was developed based on what we saw that the uh, patients were taught at the diabetes clinic at Kagando Hospital. And then we had, before we started the data collection, we adapted all the questionnaires to the local setting, meaning that for the physical activity questionnaire, we uh, changed uh, activities like snow shoveling with activities like uh, uh, chopping firewood or fetching water. And, and then for alcohol, we also changed the alcohol, or we asked the local alcohol brood, which is Tonto and Umukumbuchi. And then of strong alcohol, they drink Rachi and Big Five. Lastly, we developed this event calendar since some of the participants were not aware of the year they were born, so then we had to estimate how old they approximately were. And this was developed in a collaboration with a local history teacher. Lastly, we collected GPS data on household level and at health centers and hospitals. So we also uh, uh, had some qualitative data, and here we collected uh, observational data uh, at the uh, diabetes clinics. And then we also had a lot of uh, small interviews with stakeholders, with patients, and with people working in the different types of health facilities. We also had 10 in-depth uh, semi-structured interviews with uh, 10 patients with diabetes. And we had an in-depth interview with the diabetes nurse teaching at Kagando Hospital. Here you can see a situation with an informant being interviewed. So for the data anal uh, analysis, I have uh, decided to show you a few of the variables. I will not go into them, but just tell you a little about how they were used in the analysis. So we used HbA1c and fasting uh, plasma glucose as continuous variable. We used body mass in in index as a categorical variable, uh, so it's the base sometimes, and we used the WHO uh, standards both for adults and for adolescents. We also calculated the upper arm fat area according to the formula developed by Frisantio. For physical activity, both of the variables were used as the categorical variable, variables. <laughs> Uh, and for nutrition, I chose to include the number of weekly servings of uh, staples and the amount of cooking used per day per household member in the household. And these two uh, variables were at household level. Then for um, the socioeconomic stages, we decided to do a principal component analysis where we included a lot of uh, indicators which we, during our period, which were half a year before we started the data uh, collection, and we thought these uh, indicators uh, very well um, would, uh, would uh, illustrate the wealth in the household in, the, in this uh, area of Uganda. And also, um, this was also something local people would mention as thing that was important. The diabetes knowledge score was used as, as two different variables, one in study one and one in study two. Then in all the statistical analysis that I won't go into yet, uh, maybe later, we don't know, uh, we took uh, clustering as a household level into account when we did the analysis. For the qualitative data analysis, we used um, content analysis where we um, manually coded and organized the, the data into analytical units, meaning units and themes. And here's a screen dump where you can see some codes. So that was the data we collected. I'll just take a little sip of water. So what did we get out of all this work? This is the overall characteristics of the household members living in the diabetic and the non-diabetic household. And they didn't differ in the sex ratio and age, but we saw that they had a higher level of education in the diabetic household, and they had a higher level of socioeconomic status. If we then go into the results for the sub study one, where we wanted to look and compare the cardiometabolic risk factor and knowledge in the individuals without diagnosed uh, diabetes living in the diabetic and the non-diabetic household, then we saw that 
Fasting plasma glucose was lower if you were living in a diabetic household. And there's no people with diagnosed type 2 diabetes included in this analysis. We also saw that there were a high number of underweight people in the non-diabetic household. For smoking, we saw that the smoking prevalence was much higher, or it was lower if you lived in a diabetic household. And then for knowledge, people living in a diabetic household had a much higher knowledge score than if you lived in a non-diabetic um, household. And all, this, uh, all the data shown here was statistically significantly different. In, some, in the other variables, we didn't see any difference. We didn't see any difference in HbA1c, hypertension, measures of anthropometry, physical activity, or uh, nutrition. We then chose to stratify the data, and for HbA1c, we then saw that uh, stratifying into two age groups, a younger one below 30 and an older one above 30, um, the younger age group had lower HbA1c if they came from a diabetic household than if they came from a non-diabetic household. When we stratified into the sexes, we saw that males, again, had lower HbA1c if living in a diabetic household compared to a non-diabetic household. We didn't see any difference between the females or the older individuals. So, study two. In order to see how the uh, knowledge uh, diffused, we, uh, we did some observations at the diabetes clinic where we saw that the homework that the patients were giving were related to nutrition, physical activity, smoking cessation, awareness of hand and handling of hypo and hyperglycemia, and intake of medication. If we then knew and looked into what does this uh, household member then know about diabetes, uh, related homework. Then we saw, we had 10 questions. We saw that at least 64.8% of the people living in a diabetic household, not the person with diabetes, the others, uh, knew the correct answer to all the questions, where 45.7% uh, knew the correct answer if they lived in a non-diabetic household. For four questions, there was, uh, there was a higher odds of answering correct if you were in a diabetic household. And that correction, that questions were related to diabetes and uh, complications, to how to handle low blood sugar, how sugary foods affect the blood sugar, and then uh, if exercise is good for a patient with type 2 diabetes. So, when uh, interviewing the patients, we uh, ex uh, explored uh, two sources of diabetes-related knowledge for family members. First, if the patient was admitted at the hospital, but mostly uh, from the patient him or herself. They would educate their family in relation to cooking. Uh, in almost all of the household, it, uh, the patient with diabetes had uh, taught or educated a family member to take care of the cooking. And, but also, um, uh, related to social uh, support and gathering would they uh, educate family members. And we saw a gender difference here that it was mostly the women who would be educated in relation to these tasks and the men would uh, receive the education in relation to, to the more social uh, things. Also, um, some of the patients reported that they didn't even, uh, didn't only teach the family members uh, in the same household. They would also talk with other families at bigger social gatherings, like burials and funerals, the same, and weddings. Um, but also neighbors would come and ask them about diabetes. Interestingly, there were no, I don't know if that's interesting, but there was no education targeted family members. And also, uh, wherever we talk with people, knowledge about the potential prevention of type 2 diabetes was almost completely lagging. So how was the house, uh, homework then practice in the household? Well, none of the patients were able to follow these cooking instru instructions, which was the area that they talked most about. They couldn't follow them completely, um, but they would sort of, um, um, yeah, instead of following them completely, they would just, uh, what you say, uh, change them a little so they fitted better into the daily life. And it was the reason why they didn't follow them completely was often lack of financial resources to buy some special uh, food items, but also the needs of other household members. And then they told that some meals they would be prepared especially for the patient with diabetes, while others would just be modified so that everyone could eat them. Then in the last sub-study, we looked at the availability of diabetes treatment. And um, we only found one uh, health center below hospital uh, level who were possession of a glucose, uh, blood glucose, uh, 
glucose meter. And maybe I should uh, tell you that in Uganda, none of these patients were in possession of, their, of a private glucose meter. So they could only have their blood glucose measured when they went to the hospital. We saw that two uh, hospitals in the district had a diabetes clinic. There was a big difference between the one in the public facility taking place once a month, having no educational component, but being almost free of charge. And, uh, and there would also be more than 100 people coming. We then had the weekly diabetes clinic at the private not-for-profit hospital, Kagando Hospital, which had an educational component lasting one to two hours and had uh, the charge for the services and there would only be like 10, 15 people attending that clinic. Uh, both of these clinics had periods where they were stuck out of either medicine, or, and that could be both insulin or oral medication, but also out of strips. And this is a picture of one visit at Kaganda Hospital, all the glucose meter they had that they didn't have strips for. In contrast, we uh, rarely found that, uh, or we never heard that private clinics or private pharmacies uh, had periods with stock outs. And then also, none of the herbalists or herbal clinic we visited uh, were, had available uh, treatment for diabetes. So one thing is the availability, another thing is the accessibility. So interviewing these 10 patients, we saw that patients with a high socioeconomic status, they were well controlled with their diabetes, or they had lived for more than 20 years with their diabetes. Uh, they had between 11 to 12 consultations a year, which uh, is, uh, fits with the recommendation from the hospitals so coming once a month. And the place of treatment was uh, based on the services, the preference for the place for treatment. Then in contrast, we had the patients with low or medium socioeconomic status. Only one of them was well controlled uh, for the diabetes. None of them had lived longer than 13 years uh, with the disease. Uh, the range of consultation was 2 to 11, and all of them uh, placed uh, their, pre their preference was based on uh, affordability. They, but I have to say, they were aware of, of, of the choices they took. They know taking the three treatment option of, at one hospital had a transportation cost that they calculated if that was worth going there to a free medication. And they also knew, I won't get education, but so they, they it was, it was, um, and for most of them, an informed choice, if you can say so. Um, so we can see that this indicates that if you have a high socioeconomic status, um, uh, the economic uh, capital may improve your management and then also your access to care. But besides the economic part of being from a high socioeconomic status, we also saw that the patients coming from these households, they, um, they were better Speaking with the health staff at the hospital, one of them could get a treatment even if he didn't have money that day, he would come back. One of them would uh, decide when to come for treatment, when, which none of the other patients were doing. So in contrast, the patients over here, they had uh, huge problems communicating with the health staff. So therefore, um, we also uh, saw a lack of, uh, that a lack of cultural capital can act as a barrier for care and management of type 2 diabetes. Then, uh, we looked into connections. What do they mean for the accessibility to diabetes treatment? Well, if you know someone who works in the health uh, system, you are really good at because it may entitle you to free treatment, but it will also, um, having someone working inside the hospital system can kind of act as a bridge builder between you and the health staff. So even if you can't communicate yourself, you will have someone to communicate on your behalf. And interestingly, the patients were aware of this advantage, as some of them would educate a family member to be employed in the health system, and one of them actually asked us if we could like, talk with the health staff um, on his behalf. And then also knowing other patients were important because the patients would uh, share experiences, they would share knowledge about where to get treatment, and especially where to get free treatment. So uh, we also saw that social capital increased the access to care, and even if you don't have economic or cultural capital, knowing someone in the health system um, can compensate uh, for these lacks. So, discussion of the results. So I have chosen three key findings that I would like to discuss since I'm only allowed limited time. So the first one I will discuss is um, why we saw this uh, potentially more favorable uh, cardiometabolic uh, risk factor profile in the diabetic household than in the non-diabetic household. 
would like to discuss a little about how these patients manage their diabetes and how they're supported and how um, the family members may obtain knowledge. And then I would like to discuss a little about the, um, accessing the limited diabetes treatment and how, uh, and how the three uh, capitals affected that. So the first one. We saw this difference in smoking prevalence, and we also uh, experienced that the patient had been told to stop smoking at the diabetes clinic. We saw the difference in the fasting blood glucose, and we saw the uh, difference in the HbA1c in the males and in the younger individuals. But we could not explain these differences by any, by any differences in anthropometry, diet, or physical activity. We also saw this uh, higher diabetes-related knowledge um, in the diabetic household, but we couldn't find any associations between what people knew and uh, the level of their risk factor uh, profiles or their risk factor variables. So it could be speculated that maybe these potential um, benefits are due to what we have chosen to call unintended spillover effects of the homework. So we saw that, that the patient made not change the diet completely, but they will change it a little, and then maybe uh, some of the family members will eat more healthy than they would do otherwise. And also, 12 of the diabetes patients were former smokers. Stopping smoking may also affect the rest of the household. So if we look into the evidence, there are these two studies from the US finding positive spillovers of, uh, on spouses, and if the other spouse uh, is involved, is enrolled in a lifestyle uh, intervention. But then we also have some evidence contract, uh, contradicting uh, our findings. We have that quite a number of studies have found a higher risk for type 2 diabetes in family members to someone with type 2 diabetes. And we also know that spouses of a person with type 2 diabetes has a higher risk for type 2 diabetes than if you have no relative with the disease or not married to someone with the disease. Um, we also, uh, there is also a small study finding that even though family members to a person with type 2 diabetes are more aware of the risk factors, they also have a higher level of them compared to people without relatives with the disease. In this study, uh, the relatives didn't live in the same household, so potential unintended <laughs> spillover effects may not occur. And up here, of course, we can assume that the spouse lives in the same household, but we don't know so much about the patients besides the, the risks. Then um, this uh, homework part in the uh, sub-study two, um, that uh, the patients we had, they found that uh, the diet regime required for the management of their diabetes was the hardest one to carry out, and that is in line with some other studies we have seen from, uh, also from some sub-Saharan African. Uh, we also saw that uh, that family, the family support most often is, related, is re, in relation to the diet requirements in, uh, from other studies. And then uh, the previous studies where we see that family members may have higher knowledge if they are in family with someone with type 2 diabetes, it has focused a lot of the risk factors for diabetes, but not uh, the areas related to diet and physical activity. Most studies... Uh, have investigated diabetes as a burden for the family. We have only been able to find one study who looked at uh, if living with, some, living with a person with uh, diabetes could uh, have a positive influence of life. Yeah, so that was one study, and they didn't specify the area. People just say, yeah, it has a positive impact. If we then look at the access to uh, the limited diabetes treatment options, then we had the economic capital, the finding that that people from high socioeconomic status uh, has better access has been confirmed in both studies from Tanzania and Cameroon. Uh, a study from Uganda found that when people had been to the OPD, they came out and they actually didn't know their diagnosis. They only had been uh, subscribed some medicine. So this lack of communication between health staff and, um, and patients is, is not unique for our study. It has also been seen that in a study from Tanzania, um, Patients from lower socioeconomic status had high, were treated differently than patients from um, higher socioeconomic status. And then when it comes to social capital, uh, we have also seen in two Ugandan studies that being, knowing someone in the health sector increased your access to treatment, even if it's just the gatekeeper. Uh, there's also a study from uh, 
Guinea-Bissau showing knowing the doctor is more important than socioeconomic status in order to reduce child mortality. So if we go back to this therapy management group, then what is important when you need to uh, access uh, diabetes treatment is to have a health worker in your therapy management group because they both know the system, but they also know you. So in, all, in this study, there are some important limitations that I think deserves a few comments. And some of them are related to the more method, method, methodology parts, and others are to how the household differed and how the patients differed from each other. So uh, all this data is collected uh, as cross-sectional data, and therefore we cannot say so much about um, uh, the causality. We can only say that there is an association, because we don't know the status uh, of the risk factor profile in these family before the person with type 2 diabetes got type 2 diabetes. Of course, you can uh, discuss uh, if the person with type 2 diabetes was healthier before they got type 2 diabetes, but I think that's a longer discussion. But then also, uh, we didn't record the qualitative interviews. They were all uh, transcribed uh, during the interviews, which may also have caused uh, some lack of information. All the patients were selected from this uh, pr private, uh, not-for-profit uh, health facility, and uh, that may, uh, these patients may therefore have a higher socioeconomic status than Ugandan patients in general, and these findings may not be, gen uh, we cannot general, maybe we cannot uh, use them to gener generalize for, the, for all Ugandan patients with diabetes. Um, but for a long time, this was the only option for diabetes treatment in this district. So you can, of course, argue that poor people then didn't get treatment at all, but this was where the patient would come. As you saw on one of the slides, there was a big difference in the socioeconomic status and educational level between the two types of household. It's not surprising, as we in other African studies have seen, that high socioeconomic status is a it's associated with type 2 diabetes, which is opposite to Denmark, where you see the, the, the gradient going in the other direction. Um, and we, we did um, adjust for this, this in our analysis, but, but it's not sure. We could also have the risk of residual confounding. Average time lived with type 2 diabetes could also bias some of our results related to the patients, as if you have a higher socioeconomic status, um, you may get your diagnosed early in the progression of your disease. It may then be easier to, um, to manage your disease. So there are some things with access to treatment and diagnosis of, uh, of diabetes. It may also have caused an uneven exposure to education as pa patients with this disease for a long time had a higher exposure than the people, patients who had only had the disease for two years. And then also you could speculate that people who go to education are more li uh, likely to educate their families than patients who would not attend uh, education. And again, it may uh, limit the, how we can use this knowledge for other settings. Then I would like to draw a few conclusions. Going back to this figure, we saw that patients with type 2 diabetes uh, are an important source um, for dissemination of diabetes-related uh, knowledge. So I've put a little plus out here. Um, but we also saw that education uh, and knowledge related to primary prevention of type 2 diabetes was lacking. We saw that patients with uh, type 2 diabetes and the people they share a household with, they uh, positively affect each other. Um, we have uh, that the family members support uh, the management of type 2 diabetes, but they can also increase access to healthcare. On the other side, we saw that the people uh, without diagnosed diabetes, they seem to smoke less, had lower glycemic levels, and higher diabetes related knowledge compared to um, people in household without diagnosed type 2 diabetes. Then we saw that uh, diabetes treatment in this part of Uganda is scarce, and accessing the treatment is influenced primarily by your financial status, how you interact with the health staff, and, uh, which, and on your personal relationships in the health sector. So um, we don't know if this, the family's uh, support and uh, help to access the health system, uh, how that will work. Um, for a long time if it's sustainable or if the family with a sub, uh, 
at some stage stop it. So lastly, um, I also think it deserves uh, to uh, be concluded that these, uh, due to our inclusion criteria, we can only say something about patients who lived in a household with a family. We, will also, we also had to exclude patients who live in a household where there's no uh, support. So we don't know how they are doing it, but we, but we, we could uh, speculate that they are more apt to suffer and die earlier from diabetes-related uh, morbidity because they don't have this backup. Some implications of these findings. So, um, first of all, I think it's very interesting that they know all of these things about diabetes management, but they know hardly anything about prevention. And I think that could very easily be, um, be addressed by when you educate the people about diet, not the people, the patients about diet and physical activity, then also educate them that this could also benefit your family members. Um, I also think this change in the burden of disease that's talked so much about in low-income countries needs to be addressed uh, in order for the health staff to learn how to talk with patients who have a chronic disease that requires care every day. Compare, and I know it's, it, it does not to sound mean, but if you have malaria and it's only a, a light malaria, you will get treatment and then you're done. But for diabetes, you have to go there every single month for the rest of your life. And then lastly, what I think could be really interesting to look more into if it's this findings that we cannot uh, say anything about causality with due to the cross-sectional uh, state uh, uh, nature of the study. Um, how, would, how does it look if we look at the, uh, the longitudinal, uh, inner longitudinal data where we could measure the risk factor profile in families who just had the just had the diagnosis and we could then randomize them into different arms and see how it would affect the family if someone with just one person is educated. Then the acknowledgement. Uh, some, a lot of people I would like to thank and I probably haven't put everyone in here. But of course, I would first of all like to thank my three supervisors that Bender has already introduced. And I know he's not officially, but Dr. Silva Behendeka, who could not be here today, um, supported me and a lot in Uganda, so I think he also deserves to be mentioned. Uh, I would like to thank my colleague at the International Health Section, which there are a lot of them here today, and especially uh, Pro Associate Professor Dirk or Dr. Lund. Uh, I would also like to thank people who have contributed to either the data collection or analysis. I would especially like to thank my field assistant, who uh, without them I couldn't have carried uh, out this uh, field work. I would like to thank the staff of Kaganda Hospital for always being so friendly and the families, of course, participating in this study. And then I would like to briefly mention the sponsors who made it all possible. I would like to thank my family and friends, both in Denmark and Uganda, and especially my partner, Mass. And then I will just show you a few pictures for a dissemination seminar we just conducted uh, in November where we uh, uh, talked uh, or told the results of this project and we also put it in some session about prevention of type 2 diabetes and early detection of uh, diabetes. And we invited health staff from Health Center 3, 4 and from hospitals. We invited uh, some village team, um, health, uh, village team, village health teams and we invited uh, some of the participants in the study. You can see Dr. Silva giving a presentation here. And then we handed out 200 posters with a calendar, with symptoms, and with uh, prevention of diabetes, and a little about diabetes and the results of the research project. This is the people participating. And then I would like to say thank you for the attention. <laughs>